Hello and welcome to today's Leaders of Africa Hangout. It is great to be with you. My name is Peter Panar, and I will be moderating today's very, very exciting session here on Zoom, but also streaming live on YouTube. And this is one kind of fun thing about today, which is that if you are joining us, and we see that a number of you have joined us today on Zoom, that you will, you're, if you share your video, you will also show up in our stream. So when you're able to watch the video afterwards, you will see yourself, you will hear your comments because Leaders of Africa Hangouts is a very interactive program. And so before we get into today's talk entitled To Migrate or Not to Migrate, I wanna go through a few things first. The first thing I wanna do is I wanna welcome Miss Eva Panar, Masters of Public Policy, who joins me in the studio. Welcome to you, Eva. Thank you. And I also want to welcome a very special guest who is here with us on Zoom and who is going to come in and share a little bit of insights about recent studies done by the African uh, Political uh, Polling Institute. That is Dr. Bell Alua, who is going to be joining us. Welcome to you, Dr. Bell. Thank you, Peter. It's my pleasure to be here. It's so good to have you again, and Dr. Bell has been on a previous program looking at surveys in the context of COVID-19, so we're so grateful to have Bell back with us. So Bell is going to be talking about uh, some of his studies when we get to that section of today's presentation and today's discussion. So again, welcome to you, Dr. Bell, and welcome to you, Miss Eva. Thank Before you. we get in, um, I want to talk to you a little bit about what Hangouts is all about, what this program is all about, because I'm assuming some of you are new to this program. Well, Leaders of Africa Hangouts is an informative, informal, and discussion-based program based on Zoom. So everyone here is joining us on Zoom today, and it is also streamed live. And so the emphasis here is on discussion-based. So we're going to have a presentation. The presentation is going to be about 15 to 20 minutes. It's gonna be a little bit on the long side today, but there are gonna be questions that are interspersed in the context of the presentation. This allows you as the audience to chime in, share your views, share your perspectives on some of the things that are being discussed in today's discussion. And so this is what's really nice about this program versus many of the webinars you may have attended over the past few months, which is this is an interactive session where the audience is first and foremost. We have this program every, two, uh, every other Tuesday, so that is bi-weekly. So in two weeks from today, we will have our next Hangout. So we welcome you to join us again at 12.30 p.m. UCT. That is 1.30 p.m. Uh, in West Africa, that in Nigeria, for example. Uh, that's 2.30 at CAT, Central Africa time, and 3.30 uh, East Africa time. So good afternoon to everyone joining us here in the afternoon. And so the main bulk of this will be on moderated discussion. The last two things that we wanted to mention that relate to today's conversation is a new podcast that is going to be coming out in October. This podcast is going to be focused on data and what data can tell us about policy-oriented decision-making. And particularly, it's going to be emphasizing the importance of having evidence-based policy. And it's called the Mini Data Podcast because it is mini. In other words, it's short. It's five minutes to 15 minutes long. So it's very easy and simple to listen to. And it also emphasizes uh, big data. So it's also a little bit of a play on words. So it's going to focus on everything from big data also to small data. Uh, and this comes out in the beginning of October. So if you like some of the discussions that uh, Miss Eva and Dr. Bell are having related to data that we're going to be sharing today, tune in for this podcast release uh, that is coming in early October. And the last thing before we get going to emphasize is that we invite you to connect. Uh, Leaders of Africa does have a Facebook group, a private Facebook, Facebook group. So if you search Leaders of Africa in Facebook, you will be able to find the Facebook group. We encourage you to ask yourself to, uh, to join the Facebook group. It is uh, by invite only, so you have to uh, sort of essentially answer a couple questions and then we'll let you into the group. So we encourage you to join in our private Facebook group. We also encourage you to join in our private Telegram group, and I'll be putting the links in the chat of Zoom for you to use to find these. And then finally, we have a Discord community, which we use for chatting back and forth on some of the issues that we're going to be addressing today. 
And this is one of the key things that Leaders of Africa as an organization emphasizes is building networks and community, but not just networks that you see on simple social media platforms like LinkedIn, but ones that are meaningful, ones that are in depth, ones that reflect a lot of the substantive discussion uh, that we're going to be having today. Um, so welcome to you if you are new. Uh, and also to those of you who are returning to our program, we also welcome you as well. And we see a number of people who have been to a number of our programs. So um, without further ado, I'm going to hand off um, the presentation to Miss Eva, who will start us off and talking about our theme today, which is an important theme, that of migration and the research around migration. So Eva, over to you. Thank you so much. Um, beautiful. Um, the introduction and also the opportunity to um, talk about this important issue. Um, and also, I just want to thank everyone for making the time to be part of our discussion today. This is informative. It's going to be brief. Then we are going to get in into um, discussion. So we want it to be as interactive as possible. So if you have any question or anything, you can also drop it in the chat box. Um, either on Zoom or on the Discord community or YouTube, and we will um, talk to you. And also, if you have any question or you want to say anything, um, just use the raise hand um, icon in uh, on Zoom. Then we will let you um, talk um, to me directly. So we welcome you all. I'm just going to go ahead um, to talk about today's presentation. And as I said, if you have any question or you you want to talk, just raise your hand, and we'll let you uh, speak directly. All right. So um, this migration has become an important thing that we see going on, especially in on the continent. And with recent times, I mean, there are a lot of images on 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 social media and also on TV about people migrating to different parts of the world. And sometimes, uh, if you see some of these images coming out, you may think that a lot of people are really rushing out of Africa. So the question is, is that the case? So I'm beginning my topic by saying that migration is not a new thing to Africa. People have been migrating. Even we, we hear stories of hunting and gathering, people moving from different places um, to look for food. And if they find the ground to be fertile, they stay. So. It's not, been, it's not a new phenomenon. It's not something that is uh, current. People have been migrating for many ages and many years. So people migrate to different places for either economic, um, adventure, or educational purposes. And also uh, migration to different places is mostly done by both those that are skilled and those that are not skilled. Um, we, we see um, both young men and women trying to get to Europe, especially in recent times, if you hear the story of what is going on. Um, in, the, uh, in Libya and also on the Mediterranean Sea, looking at people drowning uh, in the sea, you're asking yourself, are Africans really leaving the continent? And if yes, then why is it the case? So we are going to explore this question as we move on. So looking at the figure on your right, you could tell that Africa is not actually a continent of mass migration. People on the continent do not actually migrate as compared to Asia. On the figure, you could see that in Africa, it's just 14% of the world population that actually migrate to different places. And also, um, in 2017, 16.9 um, million Africans were living outside the continent of Africa from 6.9 million in 1999. And if you see the, um, the figure there, you could tell that People from Europe and also people from Asia actually are the ones that migrate a lot as compared to Africans. As compared to Africans. And the reason being that is that there is a lot of intra-migration. A lot of people are actually migrating within Africa as compared to migrating outside Africa. So on the figure, you could tell that when it comes to extra-continental um, migration, that is people migrating out of Africa um, to other places. As at 1990, as at um, the year 1990, you could tell that it's around um, 6.9 million people that actually left um, up to, two, in, in, and in 2017, it's around um, uh, 6.9 million compared to intra-African migration, which is around um, 19.4 million in 
2017. So if you see the, um, the figure here, you could tell that people are not actually leaving the continent as we see with uh, what is happening on the Mediterranean Sea and also like uh, you, you hear actually friends talking about going out uh, outside, people are not actually living. What people are doing is that people are actually migrating to different countries and different places on the continent. So from here, you could tell that the top receiving countries, like the places that most Africans are likely to migrate to is South Africa, Cote d'Ivoire, Uganda, uh, Ethiopia, a lot of countries. Ghana also play a part, but I'm just looking at the top ones. South Africa, because we know like um, South Africa is probably one of um, the most developed places on the continent, I would say, and also uh, people were migrating there because of like the mining opportunities and construction. So South Africa were receiving a lot of people. So it was also an opportunity for people from around Africa and also especially in neighbors like um, Zimbabwe, Zambians and people in the southern region, they go there a lot. And you could tell that, I mean, actually in recent years, we've been hearing about the, um, the xenophobic, uh, xenophobic incident that is taking place in South Africa, where um, some South Africans were blaming the Africans for coming to take their jobs. It's also because like people see South Africa as a place with uh, different economic opportunities, so they also want to explore. And also you, see, you could see um, Ivory Coast. Most of the time, people, it, with the case of Ivory Coast, people from like Francophone countries mostly love to travel to Ivory Coast and also people from Ghana and other places. And in the case of intra-Africa um, intra migration, it also has to do with uh, places that have conflict and, and issues like that. So they send people to uh, places like Uganda, for instance, people from Burundi were taken to Uganda as refugees and things like that. So you could tell that there is a lot of intra africa migration and probably we'll, we will explore why is that a case why is it that people actually migrate within africa is it because it's cheap or is it because there are no restriction or visa related issue or is it, is it also because of the issue with the border the border are just free and people can just walk in and walk out whenever they want so we will explore that as we uh, move forward so when it comes to extra continental migration if you look at the map you could see that a lot more people are leaving Africa from Egypt, Morocco, Somalia, Nigeria. Like these are like most of the top countries that are leaving. And if you see places like um, Somalia, you ask yourself, why are people leaving um, Somalia to go to other places? Also, you also have to understand the history of conflict in Somalia. So people are moving to Somalia um, to other places because they want to find freedom, they want to find peace and also security. And Egypt, most of the time, people leave Egypt to places like the, uh, the Middle East or Asia because Middle East is closer to Egypt. So um, they, they move there, especially the North African countries. If you see, um, I sh actually they didn't bring the map here because if you see the North African countries where they go, most people from the North African country are either going to France or the Middle East and sometimes Europe. And also when it comes to West African countries like Nigeria, um, Nigeria, Ghana, and uh, other places, um, Nigeria and Ghana mostly are going to Europe, like say the UK or the United States. So we will continue to explore in the discussion. Let's talk more about why do people choose some of these destinations compared to other places. So as I said, people travel for various reasons. People go because of better economic opportunities. We, are, we all know and we've heard that like we, we, when you're on the continent, you hear a lot of juicy story about Europe and also the America, how things are easy there and also the things you see on TV. Um, so people, want to leave because of better economic opportunities and also probably because of the um, challenges they find in their country. Some people are saying they are going because of poor governance. Uh, we know of the issue of corruption and also poor services and things like that compel people to leave. And the other thing is people escape political instability and conflict, as I was saying, with the issue of um, Somalia, South Sudan, and even the DRC and people from Central Africa countries uh, love to leave their country because it, like, they want to leave their countries, not because like they do not want to stay there, it's because they want to find peace somewhere else, so they go. So these are the top reasons that people leave. So. To explore the topic, to migrate or not to migrate, 
we went to look at Afrobarometer data that was uh, conducted just recently between uh, 2016 and 2018. And one of the most important questions they were asking people on the continent is that, um, have you considered moving? Like how much, if at all, have you considered moving to another country? So it was surprising that if you see the, um, the figure on your right, you could tell that most people on the continent are not really interested in moving. Like they are not, even compared, looking at um, the age bracket from 18 to 25, which would say these are young people, like the youth who may be interested in traveling to, I mean, look at other places and also people who are 36 plus, um, years plus. So if you, if you see the map, you could tell that in total about 63% of the respondents said no, they are not interested in moving. They do not want to move at all. And also, if you look at people, even the youth, about 56% then said they are not ready to move. And 36 plus percent said, um, the 36 plus years, about 73% of the respondents said no, they are not ready to move. And uh, a little pe some people are like, uh, they want to move a little bit. If you even see the figure is not as much compared to people who, that are not really interested in moving. And the people that are really interested in moving, like when you go, um, those who are saying they want to move a lot, uh, you could tell that people in the, uh, like the youth, the youthful group are like just 22%. Um, and also people that do not want to move, like people that are 36 years plus, uh, just 12%. So overall, people on the continent are not really looking forward to move to other places. So. Yeah, and I, I wanted to just point out here, so some of you may not be familiar with the Afrobarometer project. So the Afrobarometer is a pan-African uh, research group, um, and there are a variety of different partners all across the continent um, that do public opinion surveys. So the nice thing about the Afrobarometer is it allows coverage of not just one country, say Nigeria or Cote d'Ivoire or Ghana, but they survey across 30 plus African countries. There are some countries that are not surveyed, such as the Democratic Republic of the Congo or Rwanda, but many, many countries, over 35 plus countries are surveyed. So the data that, you're sh that Eva is showing here, I just wanted to interject, is showing uh, the total amount on average for all of those 35 African countries plus. And so when we look at some of the research that uh, Dr. Bell has done, he's going to sort of delve in deeper into some of these particulars of different countries, because I think yeah. one of the interesting things we're going to discuss is, you know, how much do these average figures really belie individual trends that are taking place and transpiring within individual countries. So we welcome you to, to take a look at Afrobarometer's da uh, data. It's, uh, it's afrobarometer.org in case you're interested. So afrobarometer.org, I'll make sure to put that in the chat. So back to you, Eva. Yeah, so if you, as you look at it at the country level, you could tell that still a lot more people are not interested. Even people from the top there is Madagascar, then from the bottom is um, Sierra Leone. You could tell that a lot of people are comfortable staying in their country. Just a few people that really, really want to move out of the content. For me, which is a good thing. So we, I also did an analysis comparing it by educational level. Let's see people with post-secondary uh, education, are they willing to move? You're also thinking about in terms of uh, the economic opportunities because in recent years we've, we've, we've uh, actually just two weeks ago, we did um, uh, an, uh, a hangout on the issue of youth unemployment. And one of the things that we saw was that most people with advanced degree are likely to be unemployed on the continent compared to people with just basic education. So I was also comparing it to see if people with advanced degree are really interested in moving out of the continent because of the limited job opportunities that may be available in their various countries. And here we could also see that um, people with no education, a lot of people actually, people with no education, people with primary education, secondary education, and post-secondary education, almost all of them are not really interested in moving out of the continent. Uh, but if you look at people with post-education, uh, slightly more people with post-secondary education are really interested in moving, probably because one, they want to find better opportunities or they want to go for educational purposes, which we will explore why people really want to move. So this is really surprising that a lot of people, even people with more uh, post-secondary education, just a few of them really want to move. But overall, many people are not really, really looking forward to move out of the continent.
and also Afrobarometer asks them what are the top reasons why you want to leave if you want to migrate to another country and you could see that most people really want to leave because they want to find jobs I mean we know about the issue of unemployment on the continent if we if you join us last week, you would tell that it's really a daring situation that African leaders have to do something about it, especially um, with its youthful population. Um, Africa has the youngest uh, uh, population in the entire continent, uh, in the entire globe. So, with its youthful population and also people find it hard to find jobs, it will be a factor why or a reason why people would like to move. So, you could tell that people are saying that they would like to move if at all they want to move. They want to move to find jobs and also they want to escape poverty and also economic hardship. We, we know, like, a lot of people. I mean, uh, living below the poverty line, which is uh, uh, 1.9 uh, US dollars. And also, when we did um, the discussion on youth unemployment, we realized that a lot more, a lot of the youth are actually employed, but most of them are underemployed or working in the informal sector, which, I mean, uh, does not come up with any uh, growth opportunities for them to be able to climb up the ladder to um, do much better where they are. So a lot of a lot pe a lot more people, especially the youth, if, even if they are working, they are working in the informal sector or um, they are working below the poverty line, which is a concerning issue. So people were like, if I move, I'll have to move to escape the hardship that I face here in Nigeria, in Ghana, or anywhere. And also, you could tell that just few people actually really, really want to move for educational purposes, which is surprising because when I was thinking about leaving the country, one of the factors that came to mind was, I really want to go to school. I really want to have um, like different educational experiences, but education is not actually like one of the important things. People are really thinking about their, their economics. I mean, how they will be able to feed themselves and also their families. So these are really important factors. And even when it comes to issues of, um, say, tourism and seek business prospect, it wasn't really on people's radar. So my question, this is when I want you to come in um, to also share your perspective uh, with us. So the question is, does the data reflect the actuality of immigration on the continent? Because we see a lot on the news of what is going on in the continent. I'm sure that any time you watch the news, you hear that people are really drowning in the Mediterranean Sea or people really want to leave. It's also because of COVID. That's why we have not even hear about the issue of people really want to leave. But the thing is that, does the data that is presented there, is that a case? And also, why are Africans migrating for economic opportunities? Yeah, so let's, we're now going to open up the floor, and I'm going to ask uh, Dr. Bell. I know Dr. Bell is going to talk about some of the research from API in, in just a moment, but I want to invite Dr. Bell to sort of get our first word on, 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 uh, on reflecting on these questions, and then the floor is open to the audience. If you'd like to speak, just raise your hand. We will unmute you or we'll call your name, and then you can share. Eva, do you want to take down the screen so we can sh sure. show everyone there? Um, may you talk? There we go. Uh, so, Dr. Bell, uh, welcome <laughs> again. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. Um, um, great work you're doing and um, excellent data there. Um, what I see coming out from the data is we have data that we been aggregated. Um, you know, it will make some great sense to unpack that a bit more. So, um, interestingly, I've worked on research looking at the motivations for irregular migration, mm -hmm. um, and that's what we call the Europe by road. And I've also worked on research uh, more recently looking into, um, you know, more of Nigerians in this case traveling to places like Canada. And we see certain differences that exist. But I think we should, first of all, look at some commonalities that uh, are underlining there. In the case of the Euro by road, those seeking irregular migration opportunities, there are clearly certain triggers or certain drivers, if you will. Um, and just as you mentioned, Eva, the key drivers are poverty and economic motivation. Um, we cannot take the fact away that the continent has got a um, bulging youth population, and because we, we, it has a huge youth population, the issue of unemployment is rife. And because unemployment is rife, people are seeking 
um, avenues where they can go and look for opportunities elsewhere. But in the case of Nigeria, there are peculiarities. Mm. Um, um, you know, we look at the issue of irregular or what we call illegal mm. migration. Um, apart from issues of poverty and economic consideration, there are also issues of culture. <laughs> there are cultural <laughs> motivations and what we call a legacy of um, irregular migration. There are certain regions of the country, um, you know, I don't want to mention those sort of states now, but there are certain regions of the country where it has become a legacy for them to have siblings who live abroad. So, um, you know, and because of that, it's even in the community, it's even cultural mm -hmm. that they expect that someone from your family must be abroad. So um, they get to work all their life and try all their life um, and find ways to emigrate, especially through the Sahara Desert, as you talked about, and the Mediterranean Sea into Europe. And if you look at those kind of people, you will see that um, there are issues there. So they are not those with, you know, so much skills. They are those who most likely are unemployed and are looking for jobs. They are those also whose level of education are on the low side. Mm. But then that's on the irregular side. But if you cross over to the side of the um, those who are seeking opportunities in Canada and in the West, and um, you find out that that category of people are the educated, mm -hmm. the upward mobile, the highly skilled people who have decided to, uh, you know, seek immigration opportunities for certain reasons. Yes, one of those reasons to better their career prospects and to look for better jobs. Um, it's no gain saying that the economy of many countries in Africa, um, you know, are weak. And because of that, you hear about job losses, you hear about retrenchments. So people are wondering, this best that's going to happen. Can we look for opportunities elsewhere where we can know the economy is stable and we can get a better life? Um, particularly in the case of Nigeria, there's been an, the issue of heightened insecurity in the past few years. Of course, as has been by Boko Haram, and that has filtered, filtered on to other issues like uh, the banditry, the you know headsmen, and, and all of that. So we're having a situation where the heightened spate of insecurity is also beginning to, um, you know, lead to uh, some of this migration. And part of those we interviewed in our own study, for example, in the Canada Rush study, one of the major reasons they said is for the for the future of our children. Um, with the spate of insecurity at the moment, we are not sure that we want to, um, you know, train our children in this sort of country or in this sort of economy who prefer a much safer uh, country and community for our children. So these are just a, a bits and pieces, a cursory look of this side, the Europe by road or the irregular migration, and this side, those who are considering regular options as well. Our, our research, for example, showed that for Canada, there are at least 15 different um, routes and schemes people can apply. There's the temporary residency, permanent residency, the federal workers um, skill, um, you know, program, which they call the direct entry. There's the Atlantic migration program. There's the, so they're all sort of schemes and these schemes are point-based, meaning anyone can desire to apply. And if you've got those points, you'll be allowed to, um, you know, participate in that program. So uh, uh, this is just a few, I know you have more questions later and I will, I will speak to the questions, yeah, thank you. But I think that point is really important that we have to acknowledge the fact that these are the aggregate figures, right? And we want more right. fine-grained sort of discussions that are going to differ across different countries, right? And I, I think this is a useful point to, to raise. Uh, we do have a uh, hand raised from uh, Dr. Jalili Adibi. So why don't you unmute yourself? Uh, and the cat wants to Yeah, thank you so much, uh, Eva, for the beautiful presentation. And uh, that was a very brilliant uh, commentary by Dr. by the other guest speaker. Uh, one of the things that I think that is contributing to, yeah. the, to the migration of people from Africa um, is what I call the, the band of God effect. Mm. You know, and the assumption that it is easy to make it outside of Africa than staying in Africa. Uh, 
uh, because uh, in, in the past there was this notion that once you travel abroad, you definitely you are going to be prosperous. People hardly uh, really told the story that there is poverty in some of these developed countries, that there is poverty in the United States, that there is poverty in Europe, that there are homeless people in Europe, and that there are homeless people in the US. The story that people get through all the time is that you just need to get out of the continent of Africa. You are made in life. This misleading story, based on my own experience and discussion with people that have either left successfully or failed in the attempt to leave, underscore the motivation why majority of them leave the continent of Africa to go abroad. And this particularly applies to those who are not going for educational purposes, mostly applied to them. I think this is one of the reasons, because the story that get told about the US and about, the, about Europe is that possibly you are dead sure that you are going to be prosperous. That first notion of prosperity is one of the motivating factors. And that is why people will do everything possible to risk their life through the ICs, trying to get into European countries, trying to get into the United States of America, trying to get into Canada, believing that once they are there, their destiny is made. I think this is one of the factors that is actually driving the edge for that. And I also think the other factor is because of the debt, you know, debt of people that actually believe, believe in the future of Africa. Uh, I, because when you get into the neighborhood conversation about traveling abroad, you begin to see the fact that people have given up hope no, it's that it can be better. Mm -hmm. So the kinds of conversation that people are having in their neighborhood, they are not very optimistic about the future of the country. And I think this is another factor that is demoralizing a lot of people and at the same time prospering them to wanting to escape from the country. Not knowing that people there in the US too, they are frustrated with their problems. But the only difference is that they believe that they can sort things out by engaging their problem. So we need more of people who can encourage people in Africa that leaving the problem is not a solution to the problem. Instead, engaging the problems frontally on the continent and finding ways to solve the problem. I think these are some of the factors that have not really come across in the literature yeah. about some of the possible drivers why people are leaving, you know, Africa for countries in Europe and uh, in Africa and uh, in, uh, in, 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 in the U.S. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Avi. Uh, Avi. I know some people were saying that there was a little bit of noise in the background. We, we know you're working from home these days in these COVID-19. We can hear your children there in the background. <laughs> Wonderful. Um, really important and powerful comments. Eva, do you want to re uh, react? That was really great and that was so insightful. As Ghana was saying, it's also part of um, Another motivating factor has to be like some of the stories people hear about what um, is taking place in abroad and also the pictures. And also the factor of losing hope, like losing hope is really, really something that personally, when I meet people even here in the U.S. and I talk to them about the continent, about even some of the things that we are trying to do on the continent, they are like, they've lost hope. Like I, I meet some friends that they are saying that they do not really want to go back again because like they are not sure if things will work out because every day is one problem here, something here, something that. And actually, if you are here on the continent, you may think that if you are here, if you're out of the continent, you may think that you have solution to all of Africans' problem, but it's always not the case. So we can't lose hope. We can't give up on our continent. We have to keep working and to find better solutions to solve our own problem. As the African Union said, African solution for African problem. We hope that we get there. Or at least Mbeki said that. Mbeki, okay, yeah. <laughs> and others, good. Um, if there aren't any other comments, feel free to raise your hand again to, to share, but Eva's gonna press, uh, yeah, go ahead, Dr. Bell. Okay, I just wanted to touch on the, the point Dr. Jalili raised. I think that's the point I was talking about, setting cultural motivations or setting legacies yeah. of, um, yeah. of irregular migration when certain people you know, want to travel abroad because all they know around their region 
is that certain people have traveled and they come back feeling big and large and they come back looking good. Um, there's communities, they've even given them chieftaincy titles. And, you know, when they've given them chieftaincy titles, they are, you know, they, are, they now live larger than life. I remember when I conducted a study in a place called Benin City in, in, in Edo State in Nigeria, um, there, there, there's even a group of people who call themselves Association of Returnees. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Association. <laughs> so they, they formed a group, and that group now is sort of an endorsement that this gentleman has seen life. He's gone through the Sahara Desert. Um, he may have got into Libya. He may have even crossed and returned. So we give it to him. And that talks about the, the, the role of you know, traffickers, you know, I think one of the points of mention is the role of traffickers. Um, in our study, we found that a class of traffickers, they call them buggers. Uh, mm -hmm. Buggers are people who have returned from one irregular migration journey or the other, and have now become people who are scouts. They are scouts for young people in their communities who are idle, who are jobless, who they use, um, you know, some sweet talks to lure them and tell them, oh, life abroad is great. Um, you are a lady, you can get um, a job, you know, making hair in Europe. They give them all manner of story. And based on that, they form a certain perception about them. So in our study, for example, we came up with what we call the Ten Commandments of Irregular Migration. Um, That's right. These are buzzwords and slangs that the guys on the field use to encourage themselves or speak to themselves uh, and I'll give you just a few of them. So one of them is um, they tell themselves, make it or die trying. It's one of those slangs. Mm -hmm. So for those guys, it's it's a perception. You either make it or you die trying to make it. And they tell themselves um, things like, um, you know, and I'll say it in pidgin English. They say, they know they tell man. Now man, they decide for himself. <laughs> Meaning that on this journey, they don't tell these people. They decide for themselves. One of the intriguing parts of the study I did was I asked them, after all this, you know, starvation, dehydration, uh, untimely death. You travel with a team of 15. At the end of the day, only about three people get to Libya. You've seen people passing on abuse, sexual abuse. If you had the opportunity to travel again, would you still travel? To my shock, they told me, if we have the opportunity to go again, we will go again. And the question is why? Mm -hmm. The question, the answer to that is that we need to get our people to start taking responsibility. We need to get our governments to start taking responsibility. Um, just as uh, Dr. Adebi said there, you know, we need to get our people to know that Rome was not built in a day. What Europe is or what America is today is because certain people made up their minds that will make our country a better place. And we need to take that responsibility to ensure that we, we also want to make our homeland, Nigeria or Africa, a better place. Absolutely. And we also had in the chat just uh, uh, mirroring uh, that, that discussion there. Uh, Isaac Borte also said, get rich or die trying. Isaac joining us from, from Ghana. <laughs> so good. Uh, Eva, do you want to continue? No, we, oh, we have one hand up, uh, Hamid, and uh, we'd like you to unmute yourself, Hamid. And after Hamid's comment, Eva's going to give a little bit more insights into the data. So we're going to dig a little bit deeper. Um, Hamid, why don't you unmute yourself? We can hear you. I've done that. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Loud and clear. Okay, great. Uh, unfortunately, I joined the session late. Uh, you know, uh, as a result of the Nigerian factor, you have to sometimes wait for the light to be restored. Uh, if it's not restored, you have to go running around looking for petrol to fuel Jerry to and all of that. So, uh, and I know from that from that point, I want to say that uh, that is one of the reasons you know people try to look for better life outside the, the African continent, you know, when you can't access basic facilities, you know, to get things done. So, uh, so, but I think what people should be talking about, uh, uh, that's where I share a lot of perspective uh, with uh, Dr. Arebi. Mm -hmm. There must be a reason for wanting to migrate, a good reason for wanting to migrate. It shouldn't be about looking for greener pastor. It shouldn't be all about that. One of the major reasons any African can think of migrating 
is to go out there and look for sound knowledge, better education. And you should go leave the continent with the intention of returning to make your education or whatever you have garnered outside the continent to benefit the African continent. And that's where most of our, you know, uh, uh, people who leave the continent get it wrong. And, and that's where uh, the issue of brain drain comes in. People leave the continent, good brains leave the continent, and they never return. So that is the problem we have. So when you leave the continent, you have the intention of returning there. Uh, you know, uh, that, that, that's, that's, uh, that, that's a verse in, 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 in the Quran, the Holy Book, that talks about whatever you take from the earth, Allah will question you, God will question you, how much you return to the earth. So if you, if you, if you are born in the continent, it is not by accident. It, it, you, it, you have been destined to be born in that continent, to benefit that continent. And that's where people should, should have everything. People should you return and benefit the continent. So, but when people leave, thinking that they can get everything they want outside there, of course, like like uh, you know, you have also said, uh, Doctor Pinal and uh, Doctor Levy, there are challenges everywhere. Even in the United States, in Europe, there are challenges everywhere. So we should we should come, you know, face our challenges frontally and resolve the problem. That's my input. Yeah, thank, thank you. you. Thank you so much, Hamid. And I think one of the things that we're reflecting on now, it sounds, is this sort of connection between migration and the role of the diaspora or those who are connected to the diaspora in this equation. And I think this is an important thought. Obviously today we, we have a limited time to sort of explore that and in a future hangout, I think that's a topic that we should sure. definitely look at is the role of, of the diaspora in, in sort of uh, giving back or their contributions, either positive contributions or sometimes uh, negative contributions or concerning contributions. Eva, I want uh, to, to move on with the presentation. We, Eva has a few more uh, bits of data and information to share, so she'll share the screen now. Do you want to share that? There we go. Put that back up there. Yep. All right, so we've answered the question. So, or we've begun to answer the questions. <laughs> yeah, we have. I mean, when we get into discussion, we talk about some of these things that actually Hamid raised about the fact that people that go out there should think about returning. And we always engage people here. And when you talk to people, they are like, they really want to return. But one of the reasons why they are um, holding back is the fact that, like, when they go back, some of the resources or the equipment they need to work with, they may not have it. Like I have a friend who, I mean, is uh, a professor in chemistry, and he was like, if I go back, what am I going to do? I need this kind of equipment. I need this kind of gadget. I'm not going to find it very easy there. So we'll, let's talk in the discussion. Let's talk more about how we can change people's mindset and also perception about uh, going back and also what they can actually do. And also in terms of the resources that people may need, we also have to... Uh, push our government, especially policymakers, to think about, I mean, providing some of these basic facilities and resources so that when people come in with this kind of skills they have, they'll be able to find the resources that match those skills. So the Apple Barometer asks them, so if you really want to move to another country, where do you like to go, your top destination? And we could still see that a lot of people actually want to leave in the continent, if they want to migrate, they want to migrate somewhere in Africa, another country in Africa. So about 29% of the respondents said they want to migrate um, in, um, to another country in Africa or 7% 7 said somewhere in Africa. And also we, we also see that about 27% said they will go to Europe and 22 North Africa and uh, 23, and, sorry, 13% said other places. So overall, People are really interested in staying in the continent, on the continent, and also 29% are saying that they will really want to uh, I mean, stay, uh, go to somewhere on the continent, which I think is a good thing. And also moving forward with the recent um, African um, continental free trade, I hope that it will serve the opportunity it hopes to serve to be able to um, provide um, the jobs that people are really looking for through this um, uh, trade agreement that has, uh, has been implemented, which is going to provide over 1 million jobs for the next 
uh, in the next decade. So we will see how it goes. And I hope that through the implementation of this trade is going to encourage more people to actually want to stay on the content or even those that are in the diaspora want to really, really move back and do something about it. So at a country level, you could see that a lot of people want to be somewhere in Africa, like they just want to go somewhere in Africa. With the exception of people like people from Morocco, which they said that most people from Morocco said they want to go to Europe, and also um, cupboard like Cape Verde, they want to also go to Europe. So you can see that few people really want to go somewhere outside the continent, but majority of the people on the continent really want to stay in Africa. So another question. Why is another country in Africa the preferred destination for most Africans based on this data? And so when we talk, well, let's, let's hold this question. So as you get through a little bit more, we're going to come back to this question. So, okay. um, of the, of the destination and, and talk about that for the sake of time. So to answer the question to migrate or not to migrate, Afro Ramita asks people, how much planning or preparation have you done in order to move to another country? And you could see that 60% of the respondents said they do not plan to move to anywhere. So 60% are saying that they do not plan to move to anywhere. And also uh, about 29% said they are planning um, to, they are making plans to move, but no preparation yet. And only 9% said that they are actually planning to move and they are actually also in the process of like getting a visa. So. On the overall, majority of people um, that were surveyed are not planning to um, leave the continent. So let's talk a little bit about the Canada, Canada Rush, Rush survey that uh, Dr. Dr. Bell had alluded to. Eva, do you want to show some of, uh, yeah. a little bit of the data and then, then we want to obviously Bell. have Dr. Bell chime in. Go ahead, Eva, do you want to take us through oh, this just very Dr. Quickly? Bell, can you just go over it? I mean, you started with us already excellent excellent thanks thanks for this chat i think this is quite a useful one um you know i, I think for we were burdened by the fact that um, we, we had been in the country and we had seen a trend of um nigerians gradually emigrating from the country and we thought that we should give it a more you know detailed perspective into researching what was really happening. And the findings we got were, was really interesting because, as I say, there were different groups of, of you know, people. So on this particular study, we spoke to two different groups of people. One group were prospective migrants, and the other group was actual migrants, those who are, are already emigrated and currently based in Canada. And you could see that for those who want to move, there were two categories of reasons why they wanted to move. We termed one of those categories the push factors. Yeah. So the push factors are issues like yeah. the economy, issues like the better job, issues like um, insecurity, um, issues like wanting to leave the country because of their you know, family, to give their family a safer place to stay. And we had the pool factors on the other hand, which also were factors that had to do with um, the favorable Canadian immigration policy, which was attracting, um, you know, people to, to, to Canada. And as I said, there were up to over 15 different schemes where people can apply, um, you know, point-based and have the opportunity to immigrate to Canada. But let me take this down to something um, I think Hamid mentioned. He, he mentioned a very important fact that People should know why they want to, you know, leave the country, and it should be about going to get an education and come back. Uh, for me, I think it's about the balance. And research has shown that the diaspora plays a very huge role in, in terms of foreign direct investment on the continent. Take Nigeria, for example. In 2018, mm. um, the Central Bank of Nigeria reported that um, the diaspora brought in $25 billion into the country. So what came into the country from Nigeria's diaspora in 2018 was $25 billion. And you compare that to 2017, where about $22 billion came into the, the country. Between 2017 and 2018, we had three extra billion. 
So what does that tell you? It tells you that part of the money, part of the funds, you know, circulating in the economy to still make the economy what it is, is funds coming in from the diaspora. So we cannot downplay or, you know, the, the impact of the funds coming in from Nigerians who, or Africans who have gone outside the shores of Africa um, and, and have come back uh, and are sending in resources. So we did, for example, in our study, ask how often do you send money for those who have traveled? They say they send money quite often. They send money, as a matter of fact, up to 40% of that population send money back almost on a monthly basis. And that reminds me of the, the, you know, the study we had conducted in Benin in those states, where in the bank we realized that the, there is a queue for the Western Union money transfer. Mm. And that queue for Western Union money transfer had the longest queue in the whole bank, meaning that in such states there were people whose livelihoods, whose daily living was dependent on the fact that they had a relative who was living in Europe or living in the West so, but it's about the balance. And where does the balance come? The balance comes with the fact that the, the, the wider implication of this, um, you know, those migrating out of the continent is a loss of manpower. So we have highly skilled, upward mobile, employed, um, you know, Africans living to the West. What this tells you is that when it comes to doing the critical thinking on the continent, who are those going to do it? We are having in sectors like ICT, in sectors like healthcare, medicine, we have senior consultants leaving hospitals because they can no longer cope with not being paid their salaries while their counterparts in other parts of the world are you know, earning decent salary. In fact, I was having a conversation with a gentleman, a medical doctor, who told me that he earns um, just about, say, $400 per month, if I may use dollars, $400 per month, um, you know, a salary. And sometimes he's been old, but he knows that his friend who lives in Canada earns nothing less than 2005 to $3,000 monthly mm -hmm. and more, depending on area of specialization. So much as we may want to consider patriotism here and say, oh, we need to be patriotic to the continent, we also need to look at how the continent is treating or the countries are treating their citizens and, and have that sort of trade-off. There are senior consultants who have lived outside the country before, who return back to the country to sort of help out, but have now, with the state of things, made the decision to go back. In Nigeria, for example, um, doctors are on strike in some of the states. In Abuja here, I know that um, resident doctors are on strike because why um, payments for COVID-19, um, you know, the COVID-19 payments for helping to look after COVID-19 patients have not been paid. And this is simply not right. So yes, it's important to give back to the country or to give back to the continent, but we must also have a look at that balance and that interface between what is the country doing? Are we getting our acts right mm -hmm. um, um, for us to say that citizens should be more patriotic and do whatever they can do to remain on the continent or in the countries? Yeah, wonderful. And we got a couple of comments. I just want to emphasize uh, from the chat uh, from Sigun. We have also the government should make uh, the business environment more conducive and viable to encourage those in the diaspora to return. And we could probably say those also outside of, you know, living in the country as well. And others agreed uh, with, uh, with Sigon's uh, uh, contributions there. Uh, Dr. Adebi, your hand is up. Feel free to unmute yourself. Yeah, so thank you so much uh, for that uh, very brilliant uh, comment, uh, Dr. Bell. Uh, but I'm going to push back a little bit. And uh, myself, I feel guilty. I feel the burden of guilt myself. Uh, because one thing I've always thought about is this. The place we escape to, well, they have a lot of problems. And their professionals don't leave their countries because they are problems. They only see it as the very reason that they are educated. The purpose of the education is to turn around problems into progress. It's not to escape from problems. They personalize the problem facing their country. 
the leverage their professional circles, their professional commitment, their educational wherewithal to make sure that the projects are addressed, either politically or by using any other means available. Take, for example, the United States. Possibly a lot of us are aware of the challenges facing the country, and what challenges facing the existential primacy of the country. Challenges that possibly they never imagined they could face. Professionals of all walks, from all walks of life, they are turning this problem into an opportunity to make the country better. They want, they are turning it into a political issue and they are making sure that they are mobilizing people across all professional defects in order to solve this problem. I think this is one of the missing parts from the, mis, uh, from the middle class in Africa. We, the middle class in Africa, the working class in Africa, the elites, we are not doing our best by engaging those problems frontally and advancing solutions to the problem. The people make a country. The country don't make a people. When we see that the people makes a country, we know the power that we have as a people to determine who gets elected and the focus of our country and how committed our countries are towards addressing the problem. And I believe this is one thing that we really need to drive from. Instead of those guys leaving Africa saying that they want to come and pursue a medical career in the U.S., I think all of, they will be better off if they stay put without giving up, saying that we will sort it out here. We need that critical mass of people. And that was how we got the freedom uh, the, the, uh, freedom from uh, how we got our independence from the colonial masters. It wasn't easy for those, for, for those folks who comforted colonial masters. It was like fighting a dead cause, but they never gave up. They fought until they got independence from Africa. That generation we are missing now. And we need that critical thinking, committed people that will advance the progress and the advancement of Africa. And we cannot do this without making sacrifice. And that is why this concept of the sacrifice generation comes in. The sacrifice generation that fought for independence, they are gone. We need a new sacrifice generation that will fight for repositioning and making Africa one of the best continents in the world. That should be me. That should be you. That should be all of us. It is not necessary that whatever we fight for, we should benefit from it. And I think that is the selfishness on our part that we need to address. We need to speak to ourselves about it. We need to fight for our great grand generation. If the lack of Malcolm X never fought for the black in Africa, for in the United States, if all of those are stood up, never fought for the black in, in the United States, Obama never would have imagined being the president of the United States. Those who fought never became the president. Those who started, started the battle never became the president. And that is why we need to reimagine our role in the evolution of Africa as the continent that we look upon as one of the most developed continents in the world. Is it that we want to fight and reap from our labor, or want to fight for those great, great generations of ours to have a legacy? We can be good for them. Leg legacy of greatness. Thank you. So because much. every time we migrate away from Africa, People look at our continent to accord us respect. The respect the Chinese will get in the United States. I won't think it's the same respect an African will get in the United States. I won't think it's the same respect an European will get in the United States. No matter what it is. Because once they say, where are you from originally? I say you are from a country in Africa. You are from Nigeria, you are from Rwanda, you are from Somali. People already form an impression about you, an impression that is related to your roots. And that is why taking care of our youth to me is a primary ob ob obligation that we need to really be committed to in order to move the continent forward. Thank you. Thank you so much for your contributions. And we do have a number of chat contributions as well. We, we encourage you also to raise your hand and share your voice. You should not uh, feel afraid to share your voice. I, there are really some good comments in the chat, which I want to reflect on in just a moment. But before that, Eva, do you want to throw out some additional questions here um, that we can use for, uh, for our discussion? And uh, then we will uh, we'll get into those. Do you want to yeah, share your screen? I will share the screen. 
There we go. Share again. There we go. So we actually get it into the, um, the discussion side. So these are some few questions for us to think about. Um, I know some of these um, uh, questions probably have been already uh, talked about, but um, let's talk about what Ghana said. Volume seems to have gone down. We can hear Eva. Oh, oh. Thank you, Dr. Bell. There we go. <laughs> okay. So um, these are some of the questions I want us to reflect on and also um, talk about. Most of them has been already been discussed um, already um, in, in, in by Dr. Bell and also some has been raised by Ghana. So I want um, us to talk about what Ghana just said about the fact that we have to be proud of the continent and also fight for what is good for us. So if there is anyone who wants to comment on that that would be great and also one thing we should think uh we should we should think is we should ask ourselves is what um uh, what can our leaders do or to make the continent better or what can we do how do we demand accountability from our leaders so these are some of the things that we should think about and this time is open for discussion so um and do you have additional questions eva as well or Yes. Okay, do you want to share those as well? Why, why don't we throw out all the, the questions now? So one of the questions is, Africa really benefiting from um, immigration, uh, people immigrating outside, and also what are some of the repercussions of migrating on Africa's economy, and what are the factors that is preventing, like Max Estero, this is something that I'm really interested in. What are some of the factors that is actually preventing people from leaving, um, leaving the continent if they have the opportunity to go? And also, do you think that African leaders are doing enough, especially providing better economic opportunities to encourage especially the youth um, to, to want to stay? And also, what are the limitations of the data? I mean, this is not everything. Like, what are the limitations of the data? And also, the other question is, do Africans in the diaspora, um, do they have impact on African development or are the people in the diaspora doing enough to help Africans' economy? These are something we have to do. And also, what are the challenges of collecting data on migration and things like that? These are um, some aspects of the data um, that we also have to talk about in terms of getting actually good data on immigration to inform policy decision making. And also, how do we encourage policy makers to make use of this, um, to make use of data when it comes to immigration data to influence policy decision making? Because actually on the continent, I don't know about you, but I don't think that uh, policy makers are even talking enough about what is even happening um, um, right now at Libya. People dying in the Mediterranean Sea and other things. I don't think that there's enough discussion going on as to how to prevent, um, how to to, uh, I mean, how to stop people using this irregular route and facing a lot of dangers, which they still go. So our policymakers on the continent are actually talking about some of the challenges or the dangers that immigrants or um, people that migrate are facing um, in Libya, especially if they use the irregular route. Because we saw recently that in Libya, some of the migrants were being sold into slavery. So is that discussion going on on the continent to... Um, ensure that it's prevented in the future. So, so now it's open. So let's discussion. talk about a few of these questions. We have a hand up from Hakim. So I'll go to Hakim and then to you, Dr. Bell. Um, Eva, do you want to shrink that down so we can see? Sure. And you feel free to turn on your videos um, because you are on the screen. If you watch our, uh, our uh, discussion, our hangout afterwards, you will see your face there. So feel free to turn on your cameras. Um, so off to you, Hakim. Uh, first, so kindly unmute yourself, Akim Tulani. Yeah, hi. Hi, Thanks. I can hear you. Thanks so much for the opportunity. Sorry, can you hear me? Yes, loud and clear. Now we can yeah. see you. So thanks so much for the opportunity. In fact, I'm almost, I would just like to just say some things on some of the questions that have been put in front of every one of us here pertaining to the issue of migration uh, from Africa and other continents. So I don't know, am I audible enough? Yes, perfect. Yeah, thanks. So um, the first one is, is Africa benefiting from the emigration of its citizens to other countries? I'll say yes, and that is part of what um, um, someone, uh, that is part of what uh, the doctor has uh, said about the queue 
they observe in, in one of the university banks. So actually, because we have um, some of our people that have moved um, from Africa to, let's say, America or Europe, you know, based on the fact that their exchange rate favors um, them compared to the exchange rate in Africa, it's really doing a great job for them. Just a few thousand and, and dollars is a, is a big money in Africa when you convert it to our local currency. Mm -hmm. So it's actually doing a great job. There, there are lots of benefits from, from them. Then and what are the repercussions of Africa of migration on Africa's economy? Yeah, we, we have good um there are some of the some of the repercussions we, we classify them into two, the positive and negative. Those ones two are there. But on my own part, I want to ask uh, leaders of Africa as an organization that what are you guys doing particularly in ensuring all these decisions we are agreeing to a what are you guys doing in the aspect of the execution do you guys have anything you discuss with the government of africa do you guys have a way you tell you engage them directly because we won't blame those that have migrated out of west africa we won't blame them because of the uh, of the hard experience people have here in africa so many things are not right. Our standard of living is just too poor. There is archness everywhere in Africa. So we won't blame them, but our leaders, they are not the way we even see them. They are not even ready to even improve on anything. When we look at news going on in other states, other countries, it just feels sad for the, uh, for, for the continent. So that's what I'm asking. Now. Do you, are you guys, do you guys have any direct, direct stuff you leaders over Africa. So that was just for my, that was my question. But for the, for the limitation of the data, I really love what Eva has really done. She has done a great job in the aspect of um, those um, data that um, um, Africa Barometer did. It's really a great job. So that was just a few, the few um, mm -hmm. contribution I have from my own end. Thanks so much. Thank you, Akeem. We really appreciate really good comments. And well, we'll deal with that question of what, how we... I think it's advantage is an advantage. Oh, oh, hold on one second. So we will get into that discussion about what Leaders of Africa is doing and how we contribute, uh, I think, after we get a few other comments in here, because we've got a couple of others that are there. Dr. Bell, to you. Okay, thank you, uh, Peter. I, you know, I, 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 I'm really enjoying this conversation because it's getting more interesting. Um, let, let me start by saying I really love the um, the philosophical thinking and speech of, you know, Dr. Um, Jalili, I believe. You know, I'm also, you know, a philosopher, and you know, we believe that we need, um, you know, a new generation of freedom fighters for Africa. I think also moved by that sort of philosophy, um, you know, in the turn of the century, in, in 2012, I, I packed my bag, resigned my lecturing job in the UK, and decided to return home to join just by doing what, by conducting research and, you know, supporting in some way. The question is, how far has it paid off? Do people see the value of the work that you add? Does the government understand what you are trying to do? So, yes, much as we may want to say we should, you know, encourage, we should have the middle class contribute and be like the old um, founding fathers of the old, of the, you know, the United States and for new, the realities, the realities. I have over you know, 500 anecdotes from the field about people telling us how staying back in Nigeria has limited their work or returning to Nigeria. I mean, there, there are incidents. Mm -hmm. I can't begin to go into all of that now. But I, I think two things we should realize. One is the fact that globalization has made the world a smaller place. Mm. And the implication of having a smaller world is that there's a hunt of there's a hunt for talent globally. So it, it doesn't matter where you are. If you have the right talent, you can be pushed 
from any country that thinks they need your talent. Mm. So much as we may say um, doctors or IT personnel should be in Nigeria or should be in Africa, should remain on the continent, we live in a globalized world. If their services and what they carry in, in between their ears are considered important in Dubai or in the US or in Canada or wherever, and they push them, that's the world that we live in. It's the reality of globalization, and we have to you know, deal with it. But talking about solutions, because Eva has asked you know, more questions about solutions, I'll talk a bit more about some of the solutions we had put together, we had sort of theorized in this regard. One is the issue of um, resettlement of returnees. Mm. So there's been a lot of talk about, oh, the IOM, the International Office of Migration, have been helping to bring back um, you know, irregular migrants. The question is, how have we reintegrated these folks into the society? In the case of Nigeria, some of these folks come in through the airport, they put them in some place, they profile them, ask them some questions. Um, there's been some partnership with one of the telecoms company. They give them a new SIM card and they give them 1,000 Naira, less than $5. They say, take this money and go back to your state. For some of the folks, that 1,000 Naira cannot even get them to the next state. So the question is, how have we integrated these guys? Are we, do we have a policy in place such that when they come back, they can be put through through the skills development and after skills development, they can access small business loans and with small business loans, they're able to start up a small business for themselves and, you know, put themselves in order. So how are we integrating this guy? Two, the issue is that there are also security issues and economic issues on the continent that need to be addressed. There are anecdotes of people who return into the country, maybe to support in one way, and they are kidnapped. That's the last thing anyone who lives abroad will want to hear that if I come back home, that's going to happen to me. So there are areas that need to be sorted out before we, you know, it's a social contract. There are responsibilities and roles of the government and there are obligations of citizens. For, for us to be demanding such patriotism from citizens, there needs to be the responsibility part of government and it, it needs to come out. We are sitting on the keg of gunpowder. Unemployment, you know, is rife. What is being done? Many times we talk about um, unemployment, we are barely scratching the surface of unemployment. You have a body youth population of which almost 70% of your population are less than the age of 30. Mm. And the bulk of those guys are without jobs, now resorting to drug abuse, now resorting to the new king in town, the bet business. Here in Nigeria, we call bet Niger, bet king, and all of that. That's what is on the table now. And that's why, personally, I decry the state of the industrialization in the country at the moment, because these are folks who would have been in the factories if there was no work. Mm -hmm. The days we had the factories, the textile mills in Kaduna, or when we had the granite pyramids in Kano, these guys will be working. And when they are active, when they are engaged, their minds will not be thinking of going into crime or thinking of drug abuse and stuff like that. I think another point I would like to make is finally before I allow this, is the area of the international development community. Mm -hmm. Many times we get the international development community wondering, what should we do? How do we come in? Mm -hmm. we, are, we are the ones at the receiving end of migration, people of, of this illegal or irregular migration, people trying to come to Europe, people trying to sneak into the US or Canada illegally and trying to get um, asylum seeking and stuff like that. We must find ways to rehabilitate, to support funding, for the rehabilitation of some of these guys that return from um, from you know Europe or these places, and we must also provide funds for capacity building and support of local organizations that are engaged in uh, managing migration issues. There are so many local organizations engaged in managing migration, very little funding. They are struggling. And these agencies need to be strengthened. These NGOs need to be strengthened so that as they are strengthened, um, you know, we can have many of these 
returnees or many of these guys. And if the economy is booming and there are more jobs, I think people will not be thinking as much as um, departing from the continent. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you, Dr. Bell. Thank you. We're, we're having a very vigorous discussion here. We got a number of different comments um, that are there. I want to go to Hamid first and then to Ali Moro. And I should mention that uh, Hamid and Ali Moro are both uh, scholars of the Leaders of Africa Institute, which focuses on issues of policy as well as research and data. So if you are interested in, in applying to that program, it is a competitive program. So I want to pass it over to Hamid. Uh, and I see your videos on, so I will make sure to enlarge you here um, and go ahead. Okay, thank you, uh, Dr. Pina, for that uh, comment. Uh, you see, I'm very happy that uh, I have the opportunity to speak after uh, Dr. Bell, uh, uh, you know, just finished making some comments. And uh, I must say that this is my second time uh, encountering Dr. Bell. I think the first time was when we had a discussion about uh, uh online survey something you know issues are related to survey uh with the other doctor from uh, the other african co country now uh it's true dr jalili was a bit philosophical you know but i believe that uh, behind every struggle there must be a philosophy and uh, uh we must not in any way allow the realities that we are faced with to defeat us. Uh, as a matter of fact, we have a duty to keep hope alive. And that hope is that this continent can be better. And the only way this continent can be better is if we keep the hope alive. We must ensure that we keep working and striving. I remember when I was doing my master's uh, in the University of Lagos, I engaged one of the, 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 the lecturers, one of the faculty members who studied in Ukraine, and I said, you must have experienced some level of communism, you know, having studied many years in Ukraine, and, and that should have given you, that should have, uh, you know, uh, given you the opportunity to have some kind of ideology, some kind of radical ideology. So how come you are in Africa, you are back in Nigeria, and we can't even feel, you know, uh, a, a, a little bit of that ideology in you. You should, you should, uh, be acting in a way that goes beyond just teaching in the classroom. Mm. If at all you can't, you can't uh, engage government, you should at least be the type who ideologizes the students in the classroom. Students shouldn't come to class and receive uh, the theories. There should be uh, some level of uh, ideologization for students such that when they leave the, the four walls of the university, they can engage the system uh, in a way to make the system better. So the, the problem we have is that we seem to, to get weakened by the realities. We are weakened by our economic realities. We are weakened by all kinds of realities. And we are just looking for an escape route. Hmm. We want to go out. OK, we talked about the uh, benefits of uh, immigration. Yes, but those benefits are just temporary benefits. Somebody sends you a dollar today, he sends you a dollar tomorrow without taking you out of poverty permanently, it won't. It won't take your children out of poverty. So what is important is to face the problem. We must face the problem. What we have not done rightly, uh, uh, and I'm talking to Dr. Bear now, <laughs> what we have not done is we have not engaged like minds to begin to say, how do we ensure the right people are in charge of government? How do we ensure governance is in the right, is in the hands of the right set of human beings? That is the problem we have. Governance is not in the hands of the right people. And that's why we find ourselves in this crisis. We need to get to the level whereby we don't just sit down and, and feel weakened by the realities. We need to get to the level of saying, okay, what can I do? Uh, how do I, how do I, talk to like minds, how do we engage the system? How do we ensure the right people are in charge of governance? That's what we need to do. If we don't do that, if we don't get to that level, we will continue to agonize, we will continue to lament, and that will not take us anywhere. 
So that's my contribution, uh, Dr. Pina. Thank you so much, uh, uh, Hamid, for your contributions. And, and your, you've made two comments today. That's wonderful. We also had some comments in the chat from Mercy, for example. Um, she says that unemployment is the issue that needs to be uh, front row and center uh, in dealing with the uh, with with this uh, in this discussion. And she says the issue of unemployment cannot be on. Uh, overemphasized. Um, Ali Morrow, as well as uh, Patty, also, um, and as well as PC, has also mentioned that uh, Dr. Bell's comments really resonated with them. So, a number of, of you have, have mentioned that Dr. Bell's comments have really resonated with you. Uh, over to you, Ali. Um, I'm going to spotlight you there. Yeah, hello, everyone. Hi, Hi. Ali. Where are you joining us yes. from, Ali? We noticed that a lot of people are joining us today from Nigeria. Where are you joining us from, Ali? Well, I'm joining uh, the team from uh, Navrungu in the Upper East region of Ghana. Welcome. Yes, so Ghana to be precise. Uh, Peter, yes, this uh, afternoon's discussion is afternoon here in Ghana. So this afternoon's discussion has been great. And uh, I think after... Ghana, and then after uh, Dr. Bell, maybe in Africa would have said that the heads have spoken, so and they've said it all. So let's close and go home because uh, whatever we say afterwards will be diluting uh, the experiences they've shared and then the knowledge and philosophy they've brought forth. So uh, I just want to appreciate them and then thank them. I'm so uh, honored to be a part of them and then to listen to them. And then uh, they have said it all, but there are just a few comments I would like to say from my point here. And the first thing is that uh, it's always, we're always um, in the point of asking, okay, people who have migrated outside to come back. But the issue is that uh, what are we even doing to support those people to come back? And then in countries, so we have a country like in Ghana, we are always there. I think last year, Ghana even had uh, a year of return for its retainees, just in order to uh, encourage uh, people in the diaspora to come back home. And yes, the, it was in the media everywhere, year of return. But in practice, what did they do? Was it just for people to come and visit the tourism uh, tourist sites and go back? Obviously, that was the aim of the government. But it wasn't for the people to come and then uh, maybe come and contribute uh, what they've learned outside to our systems here. So we have a country or we have a continent where we know what is right. Almost all our leaders have stayed it outside. Almost all our leaders have, they travel abroad day in, day out. They are in conferences, they are in the developed world. Almost every week they are outside there. But it's like the perception is different. Once they go into, let's say, the United States, the behavior of our leaders in the United States is different from when they come back to us in Africa and then in Ghana. Mm -hmm. So it's like they come back to us here and then it is like, okay, in the Africa, oh, we don't really care what is happening. But when they go outside there, then they are the best people. They follow laws. They follow um, the, the policies. They follow what is laid down to be done. But when they come back to Africa, the story is different. And usually it is because of lack of systems. So we don't even have systems to even accommodate these people in the diaspora. Trust me, some people, most of those, like uh, Dr. Bell said, he packed his bags and then came back to Africa. And I'm sure it was a gamble. It was a risk that he took. He didn't know what was in Africa for him. There have been people that have come back to Africa and have been worse off than they were and regretted coming back to Africa because Africa do not have those structures in yeah. place. They do not even fit. So somebody is in the United States is maybe a publisher, and then you come back to Africa, Africa, we, we don't even read. So who are you going to publish your books for? Where is the publishing going to even take place? So the system that they, they can't even fit into the system that we have in Africa here. So our leaders have made a system that we do not even have that thing. Like people are not encouraged to come back home. Recently, we are seen even in the football for Adam Atuare is interested in playing for Spain than to play for Africa. We have Edin Ketia who is interested looking up to play for England than to play for Ghana. And then these are people that you just know that 100% they are Africans or they have African descent. That's how they prefer to call themselves. But 
because of uh, the systems and the structures that we have in Africa, they are not motivated to come back home to play for Africa. And mostly those who even accept to come back to Africa to play, most of them have been rejected by foreign countries, or let me say the Western countries. So once they are rejected, they then they decide to come and then play for Africa. So the issue is that they, we should have systems and structures in place for these uh, immigrants so that when people come back home, they come back home and then fit very well. But unfortunately, we do not have that. And then Dr. Bell rightly said, Africans' population, 70%, is youthful. And the politicians are interested in using the youthful population as pawns and then as hooligans to do their bits than to actually empower them to be able to stand on themselves and then to be able to contribute meaningfully to the economy of the African continent as a whole. So basically, that is my small contribution. But I think that uh, unlike asking the people in the diaspora to come and then contribute to the African economies, it is important for us to also ask what African economies is even doing for them. I mostly, I see, uh, you see countries like uh, uh, Cuba, who most Ghanaian doctors have gone to Cuba to study, and then some come back. But there are times that even before somebody gets the opportunity to go to Cuba and study, it even becomes an act of uh, maybe the person has to bribe their way to even get to Cuba. So in times like that, you see that the person, it is not like a patriotic thing. The person had to bribe to even get to Cuba. So why would I even have to come back? I don't owe the country anything because I have to con commit resources to even get to where I am. So with that, I, the allegiance is broken with the country. But if we have a system where people believe or where the country so, uh, supports people to undertake these travels, yes, it is important for us to share knowledge. And whether we like it or not, there are things in Ghana or there are Knowledge, there's knowledge in Ghana that uh, is not in Nigeria. There's knowledge in the U.S. that is not in Ghana. And it is important for people to travel and then learn or acquire that knowledge and then transfer it back to the African setting and then utilize it. So it is the duty of the countries to encourage people to go in that direction and then get that knowledge and come back. Recently, uh, the current deputy education minister of Ghana uh, I think he has spent most of his life in the United States. He's a, a scholar in the United States. But when he comes back and he's trying, you see that you, you can just feel that he's trying to put the educational system in Ghana to fit and then to work like that of the United States. Unfortunately, we have uh, the directors and then the technocrats, the bureaucrats there who would not allow you to move the, in that direction because once they allow you to move in that direction, they become absolute, they become non-important to that system. So they will still maintain that system. So you see that in Africa, most of our systems, we are running in systems that were there in the seventies. So our forefathers had the same system, but we are not willing to even change to accommodate this new knowledge that people go out to learn and then to bring it in. And for that matter, people prefer to stay outside there in their comfortable zone than to even bring it back to the country or to the continent and then to develop the continent. So that is what I have to contribute. Thank you, thank um, you, so thank you Ali. Um, that is a really good point. Um, but my question is back to you, Ali. What do you think we can do? Because you uh, mentioned a lot of important points, but I just want to hear like solution. And also, um, as you said, it looks like our leaders are not doing much for us. So how do we demand good services from them because we put them into power that is one thing we have to know we elect them elected them to power to come and to serve us but it looks like it's the other way around we are serving them then they are serving us so how do we um, engage them to actually serve us instead of serving themselves and also we serving them so how do we demand accountability and also how do we demand good services from them and as the moderator, uh, I'll come in here. Ali, you have a minute and a half on this. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Major yes. question, but we're going to wrap up yeah. in a few minutes. <laughs> yes. Uh, thank you, Eva. Yes, I think that as a people of this continent, we need, what we need is youth empowerment. We need to empower our youth. The youth need to empower it, not only in uh, formal education, but in the acquisition of skills. Uh, we always have this saying that the devil finds work for the idle hands. So uh, uh, 
uh, are equipped and then they have something doing, then you will not become a tool in the hands of a politician, but rather you focus on whatever you want to do. So one, we should uh, equip people, give them the necessary knowledge that they need to function. And then two, we should have a system that will fit or that will be welcoming to uh, people in the diaspora. And uh, if you say a system, I think um, Dr. Bell mentioned it, whereby you have, uh, you, you create a system that when somebody comes back from the diaspora, then the system in itself will identify where that person can best fit. And then that person will be sent to that area to work towards the development of the country at, or uh, the country and then the continent at large. And then also we should encourage and support. Africa is not everything that you have to pay to get something done, but we should have things working or we should have our laws working for us. So we should encourage people, yes, the country should trade off people to go outside and then learn that. Age. And then when those people come back, obviously they owe it a duty to that country to save that country and then uh, the people within that country. So those are the few comments that I have in terms of what can be done to help this to work. Lovely. Thanks. And very, very concise, Ali. Um, so as we conclude, um, I'd like to have Dr. Bell make some f final remarks, concluding remarks, and then Eva will, and then I will sort of, uh, you know, close out our session because we are up against time. So over to you, Dr. Bell. Thank you very much, Peter. Thanks, Eva. And thanks for everyone that have tuned in today to be part of this session. Um, you know, I think we need more questions like these um you know particularly amongst young people to be able to beam the searchlight on the issues affecting the continent um you know let me shoot up from um, um i think hamid's last point i, I really you know I, I i kind of have a sense i mean hamid is coming from the um the sort of unionist uh, students unions movement I, that's my sense and you know i uh, interestingly we have I, I sort of have that background too. Um, I, and, you know, when we went to university, we were really, you know, part of the union movement and we were really philosophical about the country and about the continent. And then there were three routes for us to either go to. So some of us remained in the, in the um, activism space. Some of us moved into civil society. Some of us moved into academia. I was one of those that moved into the academia. And I think for me, the idea was how can we use research to engage policymakers? Mm -hmm. um, one key question that Eva asked is how can we get um, you know, policymakers to use more of the data? And that's what we are doing. So we, first of all, at the Polling Institute, scan the environment to look at what are the issues or what are the key areas that you know, citizens want government's intervention and based on that, we can then conduct our study or our research to see how we can go in, into that space. Um, for example, in two days, on, on Thursday to be precise, we shall be launching our new report um, titled Does Nigeria Love Nigerians? Mm -hmm. um, and it's it's a study that is looking at the the social contract. How um, does the, you know, the roles and responsibility of the government to citizens is the first leg of a two-part study. The second part then is, do Nigerians love Nigeria? I'm looking at the citizens' responsibility or citizens' obligation to the government. So as I round up this conversation, let me say that on our own part, we are seeking key areas to conduct research and not only to conduct research, to also engage the key stakeholders. I mean, when we conduct a study, we engage the government. Um, we, we send letters to the National Assembly, to the Office of the Senate President, or the Office of the Speaker, yeah. even to the Presidency. We send them copies of our reports and, and seek audience with them to present um, the findings of our data. We believe that it's best to engage our leaders and hold them responsibly, responsible using um, evidence-based um, research. Because we found out from time that if you don't engage them with evidence, the odds or the chances are that they may not listen to you as much. And that's how we've been going with our own work. 
And I think this is an important point because Akeem mentioned earlier what Leaders of Africa works on. And one of the key things, and this is why we like API so much and we lo love you so much, Dr. Bell, is because we see eye to eye on this and, and the importance of, of research interacting with policy making and mm -hmm. ensuring that there is viable data that can be used that helps us think about some of these policy issues. And that is also taken on board by politicians and policy makers as well as the citizens at large. And one of the things that we have to reflect on in, in a future hangout we will be talking about, which is, do citizens trust the data that is being produced? A lot of people don't. A lot of people don't know how surveys are run. Yeah. You know, all the steps and the scientific pieces that come into creating data, mainly because there is a lot of uh, mistrust in society, and bro broadly speaking, um, and in mistrust in certain institutions. So we're going to deal with that issue, and I think this is an important, import, important point. Eva, over to you. Yeah, this has been an insightful conversation and I hope that we will continue talking about it. But overall, we need to demand accountability from our leaders. People are saying that it's impossible, but if we don't try, they will be comfortable um, working the way they are working because nobody is demanding anything from them. We need to speak out loud. Any medium you can use, social media or any other platform, speak to them, engage them. I mean, if a politician come and promise you 100 jobs and at the end of four years they're leaving office and you don't see the 100 jobs, you should be able to go to them and question them, where are the jobs? You said 100 jobs, where is the data to show? So we have to speak to them and also we have to get ourselves involved in community engagement. What are people doing at a community level? You know, if we start doing some of these things, we are going to talk about some of these um, issues that we've just raised and also come up with solutions that can be um, implemented locally. So I just want to thank you for being part of this discussion and we hope to see you next time. And uh, before we leave, just a few remarks. Eva, do you want to share the screen here oh, okay. as we close? So as we said before, we invite you to connect with us. I put the links in the Zoom chat. Uh, so join the private Facebook group. You can also follow Leaders of Africa on Facebook, Twitter, and LinkedIn. Obviously, we are there. But we also have a private Facebook group that we just inaugurated a couple of weeks ago. Please find us. I put the links in the chat, or somebody put the links in the chat. We also have a Telegram group, so if you're interested in receiving updates on reports of information related to some of the topics that we talked about today and other topics, broadly speaking, in the issues of democracy and governance, please get in touch with us uh, on our Telegram group. That is the Telegram app that some of you may be familiar with. And also join our Discord community. Discord is a platform that is used for conversations and community building in real time. It's sort of like WhatsApp, but the only difference is it's more organized around channels and community as opposed to WhatsApp, which is just a basic text messaging app. So join our Discord community. We oftentimes have events and small chats on those platforms in addition to these Hangouts. And the last thing I'll say, Eva, next slide there. The next thing I will say is that uh, we want to invite you and in to join us on a future Hangout in two weeks. Uh, we'll be announcing the topics later this week uh, for the next Hangout that happens at the same time on Tuesday. Mm -hmm. We also have a live event that Dr. Bell participated in and Hamid referenced where we do a panel discussion. So today is all about the audience and sharing your experiences and having a conversation. The live show is more about the, elite, the, uh, the sort of the uh, major panel, right? So we bring in major figures, researchers, policy makers, government officials to discuss issues with audience involvement and the focus is on the panel. And then our final program, in case you're interested, which is coming up Saturday, is the This Week program where we talk about issues of the news. When we invite you to connect with us, uh, through those uh, on those platforms uh, and you can subscribe to the YouTube channel to obviously get alerts uh, when those are live streamed. And so uh, for Eva and myself uh, here in the Leaders of Africa studio, we want to thank you again, uh, our audience, for participating today in our yeah. lively discussion, both on the Zoom chat as well as uh, 
in the um, in the comments that were made in the session. We want to thank Ms. Eva for the presentation and thank sharing you. the data. And we want to thank again Dr. Bell for all of his important contributions here, as well as looking forward to seeing the Does Do Nigerians Love Nigeria report coming out this week. So we kindly ask you to follow the Africa Polling Institute uh, on Twitter in particular at Africa Polling. It's really easy to remember, at Africa Polling, and you'll be able to get an update when that report is shared live. And we're really enthusiastic about seeing that report and hope to discuss that in the future on a live show or a hangout. So for us uh, at Leaders of Africa, we want to thank you for coming, and we will see you next time. Take care. Bye-bye.